one of the difficulties is to distinguish and at the same time to bring together the different levels on the one hand of consumption and this is very much what we see where we everybody is concerned with um, the changes of prices the things getting cheaper and cheaper massification of certain products um, getting cheap the brands getting cheap the outlets franchising this is what we see what we do not see is the second part uh, the more economic uh, reasoning and the economic background of all this uh, which is what happens actually in production <clears throat> There we are, uh, in some cases at least, uh, getting aware of things um, when we hear about uh, major shifts or major conflicts. Uh, just a quote uh, here from Italian workshops, um, because it shows as well the, the international shifts that are going hand in hand with it. Um, <clears throat> and so we have the, uh, the Brenz, uh, we have the workshops or sweatshops uh, and then we have actually uh, on another layer uh, some shifts we usually do not recognize. So in 2014 an Italian artisan spoke to the investigative television journalist uh, Sabrina Giannini. Uh, Gucci had given him, this workshop owner, a big contract. <clears throat> He said, but the pay was so low, uh, 24 hours, uh, 24 euros per bag, uh, that he had to subcontract uh, the work to a Chinese mill where employees worked uh, 14 hours days and were paid half what he made. So this is an interesting shift uh, between uh, this artisan uh, and uh, incoming workers, because these Chinese workers had been in the sweatshops uh, outside of Prado and uh, Firenze. Now, uh, when the bags made it to the stores, they were priced at between 800 and 2,000 dollars. An inspector uh, for Gucci told Giannini uh, that he saw no reason to ask employees about their working conditions. Uh, Gucci actually denounced the television uh, report uh, as false and not evidence uh, our own reality. <clears throat> uh, the company says that in the past few years it has increased scrut uh, scrutiny of its supply chain including subcontractors uh, and has blacklisted around 70 manufacturers." End quote. <clears throat> now, all this may be true in terms of uh, improving the situation uh, in some respect. At the same time, it is very much about closing the one and opening two, hours, two others. <clears throat> uh, it is said there as well that the Chinese workers who assembly design bags uh, in Tuscany, that's the article about, uh, many companies are using <coughs> inexpensive immigrant labor to manufacture handbags that be the, co the, the COVID, coveted made in Italy labor. So this is another thing. What does it actually mean, this made in Italy or whatsoever, these, these labeling processes? Um, it is important to recognize that what we see in the shops, uh, stuff getting cheaper and cheaper, uh, it, there, there's a complex, very complex story uh, linked <clears throat> to all this. It's not what we see, uh, but there are various shifts, there are various uh, unknown uh, parameters uh, as well behind what seems to be clear, what seems to be uh, labeled. <clears throat> now, one of the theories that is referred to in many cases uh, looking at the uh, situation today is that of uh, Joseph Schumpeter. His name had been mentioned already, <clears throat> but 
uh, we have been talking about the uh, entrepreneur uh, as creative uh, person. We did not talk about the destructive um, aspect, although this is a, a core issue when it comes to Schumpeter. Uh, it is the destructive side of uh, going, going hand in hand with the creative uh, entrepreneur. Actually, the creative entrepreneur uh, using this destruct destructive power uh, in order to uh, innovate not just the own company, the own process of production, uh, but to overhaul the entire process uh, of uh, production. In technological terms, in terms of uh, the managerial st uh, structure, and in terms of the organization. Um, there is a there is this thing going on in, in the background, so to say. It is not, again, what we see in the shops, but there is this a creative destruction uh, supposedly going uh, on in the background that actually makes it possible uh, that we see things uh, we actually cannot believe uh, looking at things being imported from far away uh, and even the, the cost of transport seem to be higher uh, <clears throat> than what we actually pay for. Uh, it is important to see or to look at this not only and not primarily on the uh, level of, of the individual uh, enterprise but to see it as a reinforcement on the societal level, on the, the level of the macroeconomic process. There we find these shifts uh, between uh, sectors, between departments of production, uh, that at the end of the day uh, we have a level that actually makes sense, although we are facing uh, in many cases, super exploitation, we see in other cases extreme uh, affluence uh, coming from more or less nothing when we are honest and, and uh, judge, assess uh, the process of production. So only the macro level, looking at the macro level, uh, analyzing the uh, macro level uh, makes sense in terms of the overall process um, in economic terms and in social terms. In social terms, uh, it is important to keep this in mind because what we see in many cases is that our own behavior is absolutely not rational, although um, it is rational, or it is supposedly rational, as uh, economic actor, homo economicus, that uh, we are acting um, in a utilitarian way, uh, supporting our own interest and knowing exactly uh, the outcome. We don't. We don't know the outcome, and we are not acting in rational terms, because we know that whatever we do on the market uh, is in many cases exactly undermining our own position. We buy cheap products, we have to, and we know that we are uh, perpetuating uh, something here uh, that at the end of the day will work against us. Um, it is in methodological uh, terms as well interesting or important to keep this in mind, uh, that we are facing a process where the result actually, the result of our action actually influences already uh, our act. Why we are acting, we are influenced by the real result of it. Now, Schumpeter is in many cases linked in debates uh, to Konrad 
Kondorachev, Nikolai Kondorachev, and this idea of long waves uh, of development. What is behind it? First, one remark in methodological terms. Uh, it is interesting that actually Kondorachev didn't have theory. He just approached reality uh, looking at the phenomenological side of reality and development there. Now, economic processes are happening in irregular terms. It is not a linear process, uh, but we have ups and downs and uh, in different speeds and uh, there are different backgrounds as well to it. <clears throat> And what Schumpeter said or did is he looked at this process saying there are long waves and these long waves are depending on technological development um, as such uh, where we see the innovation uh, in terms of the energy used and in terms of the raw material uh, that is used in the overall that is determining the overall uh, economic development. Now we have with each long wave uh, a kind of four phases. The one is prosperity, uh, the introduction of new technology and the boom if you want, um, the, the development uh, of, of uh, the, a new living standard on the basis of uh, this new intervention, uh, invention. Sorry. Uh, and then we have a recession uh, because there is a certain, uh, up to a certain degree at least, um, there is a, a saturation of the market uh, where all this new stuff cannot be sold anymore, cannot be sold uh, to the same extent anymore as in this initial phase of prosperity. Then it comes to the depression, which is really going down and where is where, where we do not find sufficient uh, demand and uh, the supply is uh, tending towards zero um, because kind of everybody has what he or she uh, can use uh, the renewal uh, the, the renewed uh, purchases are not catching su sufficiently up which means as well that there is an additional factor uh, that actually the purchase power uh, is decreasing as well. Now following this there is an improvement um, because there is a, a tendency of uh, something is new, something new is in the air and the, the new technology actually uh, reached a, a level of, of stability. It's not a growth area, but it is an improvement in terms of um, uh, stability reached. Well, this is interesting, he said, and looked over the over a long period of time at what uh, actually happened, uh, finding out these different waves, these long waves, and the short-term development. The first one he looked at was the invention of the steam engine and cotton being the raw material um, that had been uh, determining the entire economic process. Uh, the improvement of living conditions um, on the one hand the steam engine making work easier, um, making more productive and making it more productive meant as well uh, that using cotton the living standard of the people could be uh, could could improve because at least in terms of um, clothes uh, there uh, was an improvement of a supply uh, and demand this goes hand in hand uh, according to this model and in actual fact Adam Smith referred to uh, having a shirt or having uh, more than one cotton shirt uh, as the condition of uh, overcoming uh, actually uh, poverty, the state of poverty. Now, <clears throat> this was about 1800 
1850, Conrad Jeff saw a new wave, uh, which was uh, characterized by railway and the use of steel. Uh, a huge, huge process, one has to imagine, not depending on walking on horses or uh, on anything like this, uh, to move huge weights and uh, long distances, but having a railway. Having a railway uh, using steel, this heavy material, it, it got, went hand in hand because it was possible now uh, to transport it. Um, 1850, and you see it's about 50 years, these cycles, and we have in about 1900 a uh, next uh, shift using electrical, electrical engineering and chemistry as uh, raw material. Again, a step approaching a new level of, of independence. Electricity could be used 24 hours a day, the entire year could be used for different things, making people independent of, net, uh, to some extent at least, independent uh, on natural uh, influences and chemistry. Um, of course there had been debates as well as there are debates today on genetical uh, engineering. In a way it was an equally important decisive step in terms of manipulating uh, nature. Another 50 years and we come, we always have to think it's about mass movements now, uh, petrochemicals and automobiles. Automobiles, again, making people independent, not only of nature, but even now independent to some extent on, uh, on, on society, on the infrastructure. Uh, you can drive a car not wherever you want, but at least you are not uh, bound to the rails. And it is disputed if we are facing now since the 1990s, about this time, uh, a new uh, move uh, characterized by information technology. Uh, there are good reasons for it. Uh, in all cases, we see long periods uh, where this development is um, actually prepared and uh, evolving slowly, uh, but surely. Uh, where is exactly the cut? Where is the qualitative moment that we can speak of something entirely new? It is important to see in its togetherness, in its relationality, these processes on the one hand as a life cycle of industries in technical terms and in terms of the economic development of wealth production, utilitarian approach to it, we see um, as well an organizational adaptation to this because every technology, every economic uh, way of organizing, of, 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 uh, of uh, economy, economic activity has its own organizational rationale. And of course it is as well about uh, the social behavior. Uh, social way of, of being together. Long distances are not a problem if you have the means uh, to overcome them. Important is as well that we are dealing with different uh, initiatives by individuals, but as well with the life cycle of industries uh, that makes things not independent of each other, 
um, of, of, uh, of, of human action, of praxis, uh, <clears throat> but at least that there is a, a law, if you want, a development uh, that is inherent in terms of the objective uh, development, the objective potential. Now we can see, as I said, this development of these developments on different levels, and we can link this as well immediately uh, to our topic, namely enterprises, uh, the firms, and uh, work labor. Uh, I dare to suggest that it is the enterprise that has a role to play in terms of this innovation. Uh, as said, <coughs> um, Schumpeter, Schumpeter uh, had been talking about the entrepreneur, somebody who undertakes something and who is innov innovative. Uh, he has, uh, of course, the, protif, uh, the, the profit motive, but who has as well this idea, this motive of um, a, a professional uh, a move forward, uh, something to, to change uh, reality, to change our relationship um, to reality. In the, in the firm, we find a kind of consolidation of this uh, development, the institutionalization, uh, the optimizing processes, uh, the rationalization of these processes that make it possible uh, to be or to con concentrate on the issue of profitability. It's not the innovation, it is about the profitability, it is about stabilizing not just income on a low level, but stabilizing an increasing income, which means as well uh, to orient towards jobs. In the first case, we may say it is a change oriented towards um, a change of, of quality, and now it is about uh, quantity. Growth, the, par <coughs> the paradox being that it is going hand in hand with over accumulation and the production of abundance. Scarcity stands at the beginning. We can say to some extent there is a, a new need, a new want, and then comes abundance. Uh, products are easily available, are relatively cheap, and uh, the idea is as well of the entrepreneur still, of the producer, of the uh, proprietor of the firm, uh, to produce as much as possible and uh, to, to keep the ball rolling. This is the principle. If you don't keep the ball rolling, um, the entire, or even if you slow down, uh, the entire process will come to a whole. Um, the, the, the state plays a role, the legislation plays a role, and uh, it is here as well <clears throat> where we find the establishment of, of, of different uh, layers of, of dependence. Um, the, the monopolies uh, creating, establishing dependencies, uh, the hierarchies within the working class, and this come uh, with this we come uh, to the third level, namely uh, work, labor, where we find another way of um, consolidation, and this is the consolidation in social terms in the way of living together, in the way of organizing work in the form, uh, which is very much a matter of how do people uh, behave. There is one problem I want to mention at least 
en passant, we cannot uh, establish, uh, elaborate it here, um, but this process of consolidation on both sides, the uh, firm and the um, worker as well, has or is linked to some processes of uh, the change of the, what is called the organic uh, composition of capital. Labor is getting less important, is being replaced by uh, capital, which is much more productive. The problem being that it doesn't really create new values. It is this perpetuation on the same level and uh, there is no new value really created. So the profit rate is falling, whereas the profit is increasing. I say more and more products, and even if I get less from the sale of each product, I get, in overall terms, more. The absolute profit, profitability is increasing. The profit rate, meaning ratio, ratio to what I invest um, is uh, lowering. <clears throat> so this is a matter of enterprises and firms as well of how to get organized to actually aim on at least stabilizing the rate of profit and not allowing a further and a rapid decrease. The relationship between what is going on in within the firm and outside within the overall uh, on, uh, um, enterprise uh, and outside of it <coughs> is fluid. It can be changed and here it is the aim or it is a strategy uh, to leave the unprofitable parts outside and only to capture directly uh, the profitable parts. Work intensive being executed within the firm or enterprise and the, uh, sorry, not, not the work intensive, that the work intensive is out, uh, outside, which means the other enterprises, subcontractors, do not make uh, much profit. The other way around, uh, inside the small circle, is actually not productive in the strict sense, or not very productive, but in a position to capture um, the profit from outside. In this way, it is a little bit playing around with profit and profit rate. And another important uh, borderline, if you want, that has to be uh, looked at in methodological terms is the one between the micro, the meso, and the macro level. Uh, of course, the individual enterprise is only part of the entire uh, macroeconomy as such it is a micro at most meso actor nevertheless especially if we look at today's enterprises they are so huge that they can actually be considered uh, to be <coughs> macro players it is not only, but it is as uh, a matter of lobbying, but it is as well uh, developing this economic strength that we know by the slogan, too big to fail. As such, the control is not 
is simply an economic one in a, in a very narrow sense, but it is a socio-economic and socio-political role these enterprises play and can play. Uh, they are listened to, they play a role, and the action, whatever they undertake, is determining, uh, determining uh, society. The entire uh, formation of societies, the entire standing of nation states, and we are still dealing with nation states, um, and the entire process of uh, what, what is called economic performance. <clears throat> All this is based on the understanding of work that had been introduced in uh, at, at the beginning, in the beginning, that we say it is employed activities, it is goal-oriented, and it is employed activity in terms of um, wage labor. Coming to an end, at least I want to question this and say there is actually no need uh, to maintain this model. We can say as well, and here I go um, taking one for many uh, Frigga Hawks ap uh, approach, we can say as well uh, work uh, is about a complex process of production and reproduction of daily life um, and it has, as uh, Frigga says, four pillars. It is employment, it is uh, wage um, earning wages. It is reproduction. It is politics in terms of daily politics, not the major political activity, and it is about culture. These are important um, aspects that have to be kept in mind. Uh, building this, this one perspective of uh, life and reproduction uh, of societies. In one or another, and here I come to uh, another point, in one or another uh, way, all this is and has to be as well considered in, uh, in, in enterprises, in firms, in uh, organizing the main uh, stream economic processes. <clears throat> this is what we usually call capitalism, and we say today more and more uh, it is not about capitalism, but it is neoliberalism. Um, nevertheless, we find this since the 1990s a debate that highlights more the differences, saying, okay, there is capitalism, but there is a variety of capitalism. It's a world of welfare, three worlds of welfare. Um, Esprit Anderson, uh, Michel Albert was coming up uh, with a complementing this debate. And now, since 2000, uh, we have another approach by Hall and I cannot pronounce his name, Sakrisha. Um, who say there is a variety of capitalism. So, yes, capitalism, but it is different capitalisms. They establish this uh, uh, orientation on the following. The industrial uh, relations are different. Uh, meaning the, the way, the position uh, of workers, um, the way of organizing labor power, the power um, of uh, entrepreneurs, and we have, of course, uh, in the extreme, the trade union free enterprise 
uh, standing against coup, de coup determination, whether there is an institutional process guaranteed uh, that um, workers have influence as well. Uh, second uh, point they mention is the organization of education and training. The way, the different ways of organizing education and training uh, shapes a different way of capitalism, not least because it determines, of course, as well, uh, industrial relations and as well the position, the social position uh, of the workers and the different uh, groups of workers. Mm. Then we have another dimension to it, which is corporate finance. Uh, there are various models, well, I don't know, models is, is not really the correct term, various, uh, various ways of organizing corporate finance. Uh, it is as well the meaning of finance. Uh, being invited to conference uh, in October, uh, it just comes to my mind, the, the way as well of the public finances, uh, provision of infrastructure. In some countries you have uh, banks uh, that are uh, public banks that are supporting economic processes in a very politically led, um, not profitably, profit-oriented way. Uh, and of course you have the uh, cooperative banks, uh, the credit unions, playing a different, distinct role. Or you have simply finance capital as it is dominant uh, today. And uh, there is another level then, which is the relationship between the, the different enterprises. They are part of an overall economic process. And of course, this is determining simply setting the conditions, but it is as well the way of organizing the relationship uh, between enterprises. <clears throat> uh, trade unions are commonly uh, well known, their existence, but uh, it is not so well known uh, for good reasons, uh, that also the entrepreneurs uh, are organizing themselves, are relating to each other, are, for instance, um, determining and uh, organizing the way if they uh, accept or don't accept and what kind of uh, accept cities um, agreements with the trade unions. <clears throat> And a final moment is concerned with the integration, the, the, the way of integrating uh, the, the different layers, of building an entity uh, of the entire economic process by the economic actors themselves, but as well here, importantly, the state and the law uh, playing a huge major role. At the end of the day, saying the state, these states, modern states, are based on the rule of law only means that there are legal provisions according to which uh, enterprises, firms and workforce are relating to each other. The position within society they obtain, they can obtain, they can claim. And as such, <clears throat> we are dealing or we have been dealing 
throughout this course that with social processes, with socio-political processes, uh, centrally based on power, not political power in terms of parliamentary or government power, but power in terms of uh, hegemony uh, that is determining uh, the way in which we live together. In famously, um, Angela Merkel had been talking about the Swabian housewife and claiming that the economy of a state should consider this as the standard. The housewife, the Swabian housewife, always uh, keeping things in order, keeping the balance, not investing what she would not have. Uh, something the state cannot do because the state has another function. Uh, in another way, we can say actually there is this role of enterprises building the core of hegemonic systems, establishing from there not only economic power, but as well shaping society and making, at the end of the day, making our societies, our states, being some kind of enterprise and being some kind of enterprise being led by major players who have the central power and who are reaching out without allowing anybody else to intervene or to be able to claim real participative uh, power. It is this that shapes our topic of enterprise, firm and labor.